Income tax 2022-2023 depreciation overview. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Tax Year 2022. You can find it on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remembering the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, although just an outline, a scaffolding, other forms and schedules flowing into it, one of them being the Schedule C. It being an income statement in and of itself, having business income minus business expenses, the net business income in essence flowing into line one income of our income tax formula. This is the form 1040, noting the Schedule C would flow into Schedule 1, which would then flow into page 1 of form 1040, line 8. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. We see here, this is the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, in essence, an income statement, which has income and expenses. We're focused on the expenses here, and we're focused primarily on, or exclusively on, we're focused in the depreciation expense. The depreciation expense is going to be an accrual type of concept. It's one of those concepts where even if you're using a cash-based system, we have to deviate from that cash-based system, put the asset on the books as an asset, as opposed to expensing it when we purchase it. So for example, if you're on a cash-based system and you buy a large piece of equipment, then generally, even if paying cash for that equipment, we can't just expense it as equipment expense, but rather usually have to put it on the books as an asset and then depreciate it, not according to generally accepted accounting principle depreciations, but rather in accordance to whatever the tax code says we have to do with regards to depreciation. Those two rules between normal accounting depreciation and tax depreciation being quite different, meaning depreciation from an accounting standpoint would try to allocate the cost of the thing that was purchased over the useful life that it was used in, trying to accommodate the matching principle, meaning we want to be depreciating the item, expensing it, and, and allocating the expense to the same period in which it was used, consumed, to generate revenue. Now, if you're on a cash-based system, we usually record the expense when we pay the cash, but that usually lines up pretty close to the similar concept of an accrual-based system for most transactions because the cash is usually spent in an area close to when we actually consumed the expense to generate revenue, and it's easier to track the cash. But one reason we might have to deviate from that cash-based system in this case is because it's such a big difference between when we paid for the equipment and when we actually used the equipment to generate revenue. If I bought a building that I'm gonna use for 30 years into the future, and I just deducted like $100,000 in the year one for the purchase of the building, then that's a substantial deviation from the general concept that we would like from an accounting standpoint, which is to match the consumption of, of the item to when it was used to generate uh, revenue. Now, the tax code, that's a justification in terms of why for taxes, we would have to deviate to an accrual basis method, but that's a bookkeeping kind of argument because on the tax side of things, they might have us put it on the books as an asset, but still give us in essence, the full depreciation using something like an accelerated method, double declining balance as an accelerated method, as well as front loading with a 179 deduction, for example, or special depreciation. These are popular things for the, the lawmakers. Lawmakers went crazy. Because they, they allow us to depreciate more in the front years. And the argument is that that stimulates 
uh, the economy. So now we've got this big difference between depreciation for bookkeeping, which is has a different goal to try to make the books accurate to make future decision making on and taxes, which kind of uses that same concept to try to get to an accurate income to charge taxes on, but also tries to adjust our behavior by making adjustments to that general concept to try to stimulate the economy or do whatever they're trying to do. Okay, so that said, let's see what's new for 2022. So what's new? Section 179 deduction dollar limit. So we'll dive into 179 uh, in a lot more detail in future presentations. This is just what is new for 2022 here. This is one of those front loading things where they might allow you a, a bigger amount of the depreciation in year one. So for tax years beginning in 2022, the maximum section 179 expense deduction is $1,080,000. This limit is reduced by the amount by which the cost of section 179 property placed in service during the tax year exceeds $2,700,000. Also, the maximum uh, section 179 expense deduction for sport utility vehicles placed in service in tax years beginning in 2022 is 27,000. So there's a big you know, difference in terms of the limitations when we get to the sport uh, utility vehicles because of the vehicle limitations, which we'll, we'll dive into later. Depreciation limit on business vehicles. The total section 179 deduction and depreciation you can deduct for passenger automobile, including a truck or van you used in your business and first placed in service in 2022 is $19,200 if the special depreciation allowance applies or $11,200 if the, if the special depreciation allowance does not apply. See maximum depreciation in chapter five. So we'll talk about depreciation methods, what methods you have to use to depreciate, and then we'll dive into 179 special depreciate and special depreciation concepts, as well as limitations for certain types of property, such as automobiles, where the government is is uh, skeptical of for some purposes, and you know <laughs> for good reason, you would think. So what's new for 2023? So not tax year 2022. If we move on and think about what's going ahead in 2023, sometimes it's useful to think about, you know, the, the, the crossover between the two years so you could do some planning uh, between the two. Section 179 deduction dollar limits. For tax years beginning in 2023, the maximum section 179 expense deduction is $1,160,000. This limit is reduced by the amount by which the cost of section 179 property placed in service during the tax year exceeds $2,890,000. Also, the maximum 179 expense deductions for sport utility vehicles placed in service in tax years beginning in 2023 is $28,900. Now, when you're learning the tax code, just note that certain types of things that you would expect to basically be rolling forward in the, in the future will be adjusted due to increases in inflation would be the general idea so you, you would expect the concept to be moving forward and then they might have a a, a code in there or a law that's going to have them increasing certain dollar amounts in accordance with inflation if you if they're going to be items that are expected to continue on into the future these front-loaded depreciation 179 and special depreciation have been quite popular but the you might think at this point in time we've been overheating i mean the, so so in terms of the economy so you would think these are some things that are on the table that they might they might stop the 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 179 and stuff you would think if they were trying to stop the economy from overheating so we'll see what they do going forward it'll be interesting so phase down of special depreciation allowance. The special depreciation allowance is 80% for certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017 and placed in service after December 31st, 2022 and before January 1st, 2024, other than certain property with a long production period and certain aircraft. So the special depreciation allowance is also 80% for certain specified plants uh, bearing fruits and nuts planted or or grafted after December 31st, 2022 and before January 1st, 2024. See certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017 and what is qualified property later. Okay, so for more information, you can take a look at some other publications. Obviously, depreciation methods 
kind of dovetail on a lot of other types of topics that, that we can dive into, some of which we've talked about, some of which we, we're not gonna go into in too much more detail, but a car. So a car is gonna, you can look at other sources such as uh, 463 travel gifts and car expenses, because obviously you, that relates to like the standard message versus the mileage method and what kind of things are deductible and should you be depreciating versus taking a mileage method and so on. Residential rental property, so 527 residential rental property is a publication uh, you might want to take a look at there obviously rental property has its its own huge host of issues one of which is depreciation can be involved with office space in your home so you can also take a look at publication 587 business use of your home so when we're talking about your home if you own the home then you might have depreciation as part of the office use in addition to other things like utilities and so forth. So this is just one component that kind of is part of all that stuff. If you're renting, then you, you won't own the property, so you won't have depreciation, but you might still have home office uh, expenses. Farm property. So you can see publication 225, Farmer's Tax Guide. Farming, uh, the whole farming industry often has differentiations between other types of industries because of the nature of the farming industry, industry and certain needs with, with regards to it. So it's a whole kind of animal in and of itself. So introduction. Depreciation is an annual income tax deduction that allows you to recover the cost or other basis of certain property over the time you use the property. So in other words, you got property, it's business property. Under normal kind of uh, income tax deductions rules, you would expect if you consumed something, you bought something, for example, and you're consuming it in order to generate revenue, you should get that as an ordinary and necessary business expense. But if you're buying something that you didn't consume, but you plan on consuming into the future, it's really more of an investment. So if I bought a forklift, I didn't consume the forklift today. I'm going to use it for the next five years or whatever. So I, sh I should on an accrual basis or just conceptually, you would think that you wouldn't get the deduction until you, until you consume the forklifts and allocate the cost over the useful life of the forklift. That's the standard accrual concept, but there will be exceptions in the tax code with accelerated depreciation methods and 179s and special and so on. So the tax code is weird. So it, it is an allowance for the wear and tear, deterioration and obsolescence of the property. So most property, you buy it, it goes down in value. Equipment, furniture, you buy it, it's gonna go down in value. You're gonna have to throw it away at some point in time or else revamp it, refix it, refurbish it or whatever you gotta do. The exception being usually real estate because real estate, although you still have to keep it up, at least the building part, as opposed to the land part, uh, it could go up in value for other reasons. It just, it just goes up in value. So real estate is the oddball. Most other pieces of equipment, you expect them to go down in value over time, and therefore you allocate the cost as you consume those items to help you generate revenue. That's the concept of depreciation. So this chapter discusses the general rules for depreciating property and answers the following questions. What property can be depreciated? Obviously, we want to, and we also, you might rephrase that question as, what property do I have to put on the books as an asset and depreciate as opposed to expensing at the point in time I purchase it from just simply a bookkeeping standpoint? What property cannot be depreciated? So what property do I not have the capacity to depreciate? You also might ask, what property don't I have to depreciate, but possibly get an expense at the point in time I purchase it as a normal business expense, right? And then when does depreciation begin and end? So when do I start the depreciation? Seems pretty straightforward when you buy the property, but the, oftentimes if you buy it like in the, in the middle of, of January or the middle of even the middle of January, you might have like a half year convention under the rules of makers rules and whatnot, meaning they kind of act like you purchased it in the middle of the year, which makes the calculation a little bit easier. Okay, and then what method, uh, and obviously when does it end? So there's gonna, there's gonna be a useful life and we're gonna have to determine what the useful life is. So how, when does the depreciation end? We base all the depreciations on like the straight line is the first 
methods you want to think about in your mind and then all these deviations makers double declining balance half year convention half month convention are all just variations over on the standard concept of taking a piece of property and just basically dividing it on by its useful life straight line method and allocating that out right but now we've got all these funny things that are happening because sometimes it makes sense from a bookkeeping standpoint and sometimes it's just the tax code doing wacky stuff to try to try to manipulate whoever they're trying to manipulate to do whatever they're trying to make them do or whatever they're doing over there because they're crazy so what method can you use to depreciate your property so which method do you have to use so we've got to be in accordance with the tax code we're not using generally accepted accounting principles we're not trying to use the method that most accurately allocates our property in accordance to an accrual accounting method for decision making purposes we're trying to maximize our tax benefits here and therefore we use the tax method that is most appropriate which legally allows us to maximize that that's the, our general goal what is the basis of your depreciable property so that's going to be like the adjusted cost of the property the basis is going to be a key important component to calculate depreciation and also if i sell the property it'll also be important to determine what the gain or loss on the sale of property is also note that i've been saying that the tax code is different than generally accepted accounting principles that means you also have a decision from a bookkeeping standpoint do you want to keep your books if you're a small business on a tax basis depreciation method which is not ideal for bookkeeping but might be the easiest thing to do so that you don't have two depreciation methods or do you want to do you want to have your bookkeeping depreciation method be better for bookkeeping purposes like a straight line or something like that and then the tax code doing whatever the wacky stuff the tax code does and that would mean that you would have different depreciation methods for the two meaning you'd have to make tax adjusting entries in essence to properly account for your books books now no bo most of the time no matter which method you use you're not going to account for it in your software oftentimes as a small business quickbooks doesn't often automatically do like depreciation methods you do adjusting journal entries and the depreciation schedules are usually something that could often be done in the tax software tax software often has the capacity to do both book and tax depreciation methods therefore you might want to make sure you coordinate with your tax professional to help have them populate the depreciation in such a way that it will be beneficial for your bookkeeping as well in other words if you want them to give you information to help you with your bookkeeping depreciation on a straight line method or something like that you're going to have to tell them to to do that right Tra have two depreciation schedules which they should be able to do oftentimes if they have decent software so how do you treat repairs and improvements what about imp repairs versus improvements what's the difference between the two do i have to uh, do i have to put on the books improvements or repairs as assets generally if you are repairing something like you're repairing the the, the roof of a building then you're restoring it to its original structure therefore you could just expense it usually but if you're improving it you're putting a whole you know you're revamping the whole thing making it something different or better than it was before instead of just bringing it whole making it whole again then you have to put it on the books possibly as a fixed asset again this there's, there's some gray area between those two things you might you might say and most of the times we would like to be able to expense it if we can instead of putting it on the books as an asset where we have to depreciate it over a long period of time so there's a whole industries that come up <laughs> trying to figure out ways that we can have shorter depreciation periods shorter depreciation lives and be able to expense things as opposed to put them on the books as improvements and so on so do you have to file form 4562 we'll talk about that how do you correct depreciation uh, deduction so what if there's a correction involved so useful items so you may want to see publication other publications you may want to check out as you're uh, as you're exploring this very interesting topic you've got five uh three four depreciating property placed in service before 1987 535 business expenses that's the well we've been talking we've been talking about that and just our general business expenses right 538 accounting periods and methods you've got 551 basis of assets and then you've got forms 
and instructions. You can take a look at the Schedule C, Form 1040, Profit or Loss from Business, which kind of relates to depreciation because you might ultimately deduct depreciation on a Schedule C if you have a small business, for example. Uh, 20, form 2106, uh, Employee Business Expense. You've got Form uh, 3115, Application for Change in Accounting Method. If you want to change things up on the accounting method, you got to ask permission for that. Uh, form 4562 depreciation and amortization so you could take a look at those forms and the related instructions for them so terms you may need to know as we go through this whole depreciation thing adjusted basis so when we talk about the basis you can kind of think about it as the cost that you're allocating over the useful life and then we've got the adjustments to to the cost so the adjusted basis is where your basis is at which is going to be used to calculate the next year's depreciation, for example, and also could be useful when there's a sale or disposal of the property to help determine if there's gain or loss. Note that we usually want our adjusted basis, our basis, in essence, our cost that hasn't been eaten up. We want that to be as high as possible usually. Why? Because if we have a high basis that means that theoretically we have more stuff that i get to depreciate in the future so in other words when we buy a piece of equipment if for like sixty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars piece of equipment we would like to depreciate as much in the first year as possible but the more we depreciate the lower the adjusted basis will be so you know in a perfect world we'd like to depreciate as much as possible and still have a high basis right because the high basis means that in the future, I can usually depreciate more against it. And if I was to sell the item, a higher basis means the sales price minus the cost or adjusted basis, the gain will be lower. Gains are bad for taxes. We'd pay taxes on it. So lower gain or a greater loss. So then we have uh, the basis. So these terms are obviously somewhat related. We got the basis kind of like the cost, the adjusted basis being the basis that's gonna be adjusted. Uh, as time passes, commuting, like miles, uh, dispositions, when we uh, s dispose of uh, property planting equipment, fair market value, often shown as FMV, how much, you know, if you were to sell something on the market, would you receive at a fair market value, common term that we need to conceptually use from time to time, intangible property, property that you can't kick because it's not tangible. You can't touch it either. You can't hit it or anything, but it still has value like patents and whatnot. Listed property, placed in service, uh, tangible property. So you got intangible and tangible, obviously options. Uh, uh, term interest and useful life. So we'll dive into, so you can, we'll dive into more of these concepts as we start to, you know, apply them in context of a discussion. So what property can be depreciated? You can depreciate most types of tangible property. That's the kind you can kick, touch, whatnot, except land. Land, you can't depreciate such as buildings, machinery. So you can't depreciate land because the idea is that land isn't going to deteriorate over time. Everything else does. Buildings do. The, the equipment deteriorates over time. So, so you can't depreciate land because over our human lifetimes, it should pretty much be the same. So you can ha depreciate buildings, machinery, vehicles, furniture, and equipment. Now you might ask, how am I gonna depreciate the building when I paid for the building and the land that it's sitting on at the same time, you know, it's as a, in a one lump sum. Well, you have to break out the portion that you paid for the land versus the building in some way. And you would like to lean towards the building portion, if at all possible, in the appraisal process, because that's the part that you get to depreciate, which is good for taxes. You can also depreciate certain intangible property, such as patents, copyrights, and computer software. So if you have, these are things that have value, but they, but, but they're intangible things that have value due to like law, for example. So do, uh, to depreciate, the property must meet all of the following requirements. It must be property you own. So you have to own the property. You would think that would be fairly straightforward, but leases get a little bit messy because sometimes you have a lease that in form is in lease, but in actuality or in structure, it's a, it's a lease, 
But in actuality, you basically own it, right? It's a capital lease that we might have to deal with. So it must be used in your business or income producing activity. So you're not talking about your, your yacht that you just hang out with and just cruise around with because you're not using that for business. I know you have some business clients on it sometime, but you know, maybe it's probably might not be business related. <laughs> so it's gotta be business related things. That's the point. It must have a determinable useful life. You gotta, so you might not know exactly what the useful life is, how long it'll last, but we have to make some estimate. The tax code will kind of force us to use whichever, whichever useful life they think is appropriate. It must be expected to last more than a year. So if you're going to consume it in a year, you would think you would get to just expense it if it was an, a normal, ordinary, and necessary business expense. The point is that you're going to get usefulness out of it multiple years into the future, which is why we would depreciate it as opposed to expensing it in the first year generally. So property you own to claim depreciation, you must usually be the owner of the property. You are considered as owning property, even if it is subject to a debt. So other things people often say is, well, you hear this with people's homes. That's not usually their business property unless they have a home office. But with the home, people say, I don't own my home. The, the bank Here's the bank. bank owns 80% of the home. That's not technically true. It, it's, kind of a, it's, it's kind of one of my little pet peeves. It kind of annoys me when people say that a little bit because sometimes they're joking and that's not, that's fine. But, but you know, there, sometimes it's actually serious. I think people actually take this seriously now and, and there's a difference. There's a difference between owning the property like a home, for example, and, the, and having a loan to the bank of 80% of it than, than the bank owning the home. And, and you can tell that difference because like if the bank came to your front door and they asked you to paint your house blue or something, you know, they don't get to say that. They don't have any say over what color to paint. They don't get any say on what your driveway looks like, what kind of plants you're gonna put in the, the yard or anything like that. They don't own your home. They don't have any rights to tell you what to do on the home. What they do have is the capacity to take action if you don't fulfill your contract to pay them on time, right? That's a that's a different thing. You don't have to you don't have to have a committee with the bank to to ask about whether or not you should you should have a garden in your backyard or anything like that so so there's a, there's a difference you could have a debt on something but still own it and and uh, depreciate it if you took out a loan for business property then you're going to be paying interest on on the loan as well so example one so you made a down payment to purchase rental property and assumed the previous owner's mortgage. So you own the property and you can depreciate it. Example two, you bought a new van that you will use only for your courier business. You will be making payments on the van over the next five years. You own the van and can depreciate it. Okay, leased property. Here's where it gets messy because sometimes people, they try to structure the lease as a lease even though it's actually in essence basically a purchase and why would they do that oftentimes for tax reasons or liability reasons or something like that so now you have situations where you got to think okay it's a lease but now it's a capital lease because they structured it as a lease but it's basically a purchase because it looks pretty much like a purchase so you can depreciate lease property only if you retain the incidence of ownership in the property explained below. So this means you bear the burden of exhaustion of the capital investment in the property. Therefore, if you lease property from someone to use it in your trade or business or for the production of income, generally you cannot depreciate its cost because you do not retain the incidence of ownership. So if it's a normal, ordinary lease, you lease the equipment and you're gonna, it's not your equipment, then you would think that you would just be able to expense the cost of the lease payments that you are making as you make the lease payments as opposed to putting it on the, or treating the lease as a purchase, right? That would be the normal process. But if in essence, like you're, you, you're guaranteed to have that equipment for like 80% of the useful life of the equipment, the way the lease is structured, or if you're guaranteed to pay like 100% or a large portion of the price of the equipment by the time the lease term is up, or if at the end of the lease term, you are like gonna be able to have the option quotes, option quote, 
to buy the property for like a dollar, which is a very insignificant dollar amount to be paying for a piece of property. It looks a lot like a purchase in actuality and not an actual lease, right, in those cases. So if uh, you can, however, depreciate any capital improvement you make to the property, so you can see how you treat repairs and improvements uh, later in this chapter and additions and improvements under which recovery period applies in chapter four. If you lease property to someone, if you lease property to someone, you can generally depreciate its costs even if the lease E, the person leasing from you, has agreed to preserve, replace, renew, and maintain the property. However, if the lease provides that the lease is to uh, is to maintain the property and return to you the same property or its equivalent in value at the expiration of the lease in as good condition and value as when leased, you cannot depreciate the cost of the property. So incidents of ownership. Incidents of ownership in property include the following. So uh, the legal title to the property, uh, the legal obligation to pay for, pay for the property. So obviously when you're trying to say, is it your property, uh, title is gonna be a good indication. Uh, you, you, you obligation to pay for the property, you paid for it. That would be a good indication because you actually paid for the property. The responsibility to pay maintenance and operating expenses, uh, the duty to pay any taxes on the property. So if you're the one paying the property taxes, that would be somewhat of an indication that it's your property. The, the risk of loss if the property is destroyed, condemned, or demi uh, diminished in value through obsolescence or exhaustion. So life tenant, generally, if you hold business or investment property as a life tenant, you can depreciate it as if you, you were the absolute owner of the property because you have it basically for life. However, see certain term interests in property under exception property later. That's somewhat of an unusual situation. Corporative apartments. If you are a tenant stockholder in a corporative housing corporation and use your corporative apartment in your business or for the production of income, you can depreciate your stock in the corporation even though the corporation owns the apartment. So in that case, that's a form of business structure where, where you're, bu you're, buying, you're basically buying property, but it's structured kind of like a, a corporation kind of structure. So you, but you still kind of own your property that you're living in in that sense it's not like you're renting it so that's another kind of somewhat unusual exception situation